Well, hello, everybody, brothers and sisters in Messiah and Jesus the Christ. I consider this message one of the most important that I've ever given, ever given. And I'm asking you, as Philip Shields, a believer in the United States, to listen carefully, to give me your feedback. I have a vital, crucial question for you today. Will you and I ever be righteous enough to know that we will be in the kingdom of the eternal God? Will it be, if so, if you think you will be righteous enough to be in the kingdom, will it be because you finally no longer sin or ever stumble, or righteous enough, in other words, can you, in fact, ever be righteous enough in God's eyes? I want you to hang on to those thoughts. I want to ask you another question. Have you or are you, have you experienced or are you experiencing the joy of salvation? Really, are you? Or are you feeling at times condemned and just not measuring up to the high standards of the high calling of God? I want to keep asking a few more questions. Given the option, would you ever dare stack up your righteousness, the best that you can do, with God's righteousness, the best Yahweh is, the best he has done? Or wouldn't it be great to have that option to choose and accept God's very own perfect sinless righteousness, the righteousness of Yahweh, as your own righteousness? Have you ever really done that? Can we do that? Do you know that you'll be in the kingdom of God? Keep in mind, even Paul at one point said he did not consider himself to have attained yet. He said that in Philippians 3.12. But then much later, he did have the confidence to say, he said, I've fought fought a good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. And I know that there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. That's in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8. I'm not turning to all of these. These are verses, I think, as I say them, you recognize them. I'm hoping and praying that for many of you who are Sabbath-keeping conservative Christians or Messianics who put a lot of focus on overcoming and changing and obeying God, as we should be focusing on God, but also on making sure that we are changing and growing, I'm hoping this sermon today will be an eye-opener for many. So here's our Savior, Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, speaking in Matthew 5. Verse 20, at times I'll say Jesus Christ, at times I'll say Yeshua the Messiah. I think I explained that before. Matthew 5, 20, I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So does your righteousness that you have right now exceed the careful law-keeping the Pharisees demonstrated. It has to, according to Jesus, or we won't be there. But is it our own careful law-keeping, even with Yahweh's Holy Spirit, that will get us into God's kingdom? In a way, that's a trick question, I think, as you'll see. I think many conservative Christians and messianics and Sabbath keepers still are not grasping or accepting a most important gift that our Heavenly Father wants to give us and wants us to receive. And what's the result of that? We're not experiencing the joy, the bliss, the joy of His salvation, the peace of mind. We're not losing the heavy feeling of frequent failure, constant guilt and worthlessness. We are world-class at guilt and worthlessness. (laughs) I'm telling you, but we shouldn't be as children of God. That's not the way I want my children feeling. And if they are feeling that way, I look at myself as a father when they were growing up, thinking, what on earth am I doing wrong? Uh, that they don't feel happy, don't feel, you know, and there were times that they did feel failure and guilt and worthlessness, and a lot of times it was my fault. Do we find ourselves falling short of the perfect righteousness of God? If we grasp today this incredible gift we've been offered, and finally joyfully, humbly, and gratefully accept it, our lives, I believe, will begin to have a real transformation that we've never had before. We're going to experience a freedom, a joy, a peace of mind, 
and find ourselves truly transformed. It won't be just words. It will be real transformation into the righteous lives we were called to live. And I'm just learning about this myself after, what, 40, 50 years in the church, so to speak, to really understand all this. We know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom, so says the Apostle Paul. Those who teach, once saved, always saved, that you can't lose your salvation, that you can do whatever you like after you've confessed the Lord Jesus and be guaranteed entrance into the kingdom. What do you do with the whole book of Jude and Hebrews 2 and 3 and and 2 Peter 1 and 2 and 3 and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 that says the unrighteous will not be in the kingdom of heaven? Or what our master said, that unless our righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees. We can't be unrighteous and be in the kingdom. You and I continue to sin and be unrighteous, however, in our flesh from time to time. So how will we ever be seen as righteous enough to inherit the kingdom of God when all of us still sin? Even the Apostle Paul, even led by God's Spirit, even filled with God's Spirit, gifted with many gifts of the Holy Spirit said even he still found himself sinning and doing the things he hated from time to time. That's Romans 7, 15 and Romans 7, verses 19 to 20. I've read those passages many times. You're familiar with them. I think you and I have experienced the same thing, and we can identify with what Paul is saying there. So what's the answer? We all know about God's grace. We all know about receiving his forgiveness for our sins when we repent bitterly and see ourselves. I even have a sermon on the website given a few years ago titled Repenting of What You Are. I recommend you hear it. It was given live to a live audience. But then what? Our past sins are blotted out. The death penalty is paid. We stand justified before holy God, the holy Yahweh. Even future sins we commit can and will be forgiven when we repent of them and come to Yeshua, the captain of our salvation, who stands as our advocate with Father in heaven, who is faithful and just, it says in 1 John 1, 7, who is faithful and just to forgive us of all sins. And remember that was written to of people who were believers, who had already been baptized, who had already accepted Yeshua as their Savior, who had received the Holy Spirit. Okay, we know that, I think. Most of us do. But then what? The fact is we still sin too much in the flesh. The fact is we are, at least in our flesh, way, way too unrighteous for the glory of perfect Elohim, our God. If you had a choice, would you like to be as righteous as you could be, including with God's Spirit, or as righteous as the eternal God in heaven can be? That almost sounds like a silly question, doesn't it? Would you have more confidence in your own righteousness or in God's righteousness? If you could choose, would you pick your own best performance or God's own perfect, flawless performance? These are very important questions in light of today's sermon. That sounds almost silly, doesn't it, when we put it that way? But yes, we can choose to accept a gift. That's what the sermon's about today that is rarely spoken of in some circles. The gift of God's righteousness, which we can have by faith in Yeshua, in Jesus Christ. Many Protestants speak of it. It's not new to them. But they go to the ditch of license in many cases. It doesn't matter what you do after that. You are guaranteed entrance. The whole book of Jude is about that attitude. And so those of us who know we have to obey God reject all the concept, even the concept of a gift of righteousness. We all know about the gift of forgiveness, the gift of grace, the gift of unmerited pardon. We get that. We know that. We know about the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We know that. But once we're forgiven, then what? And I'm convinced most believers are still struggling in their own failed attempts at righteousness. We know even with the the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, we still fail. So will you and I ever be seen 
as having righteousness that is every whit as good as the righteousness of our Savior? That's a daring question, isn't it? Will you and I ever be seen as having righteousness that's every whit as good as the righteousness of Messiah? I submit to you today that not only can we have that righteousness that's every whit as good as the Messiah's, but we must, or we won't even be in the kingdom of God. I'm going to show you how Scripture says that comes about. But will you have to master or muster this up by careful Torah obedience, or will you accept what Scripture teaches in many places, that this righteousness is Yahweh's gift to us, His perfect righteousness? You'll find today that this righteousness is the righteousness of the kingdom, from Abel to the last person called and converted and changed at the resurrection by Yahweh. Let's turn now to Philippians 3, verses 3 to 11. Philippians 3, verses 3 to 11, and where Paul begins to make this very clear. We're also going to be reading a lot from Romans. Philippians 3, verses 3 to 11. For we are of the circumcision, who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I could have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he has confidence in the flesh, I more so. I'm in Philippians 3, verse 5 now. We're going to read Philippians 3, verses 3 to 11. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Concerning the law, I was a Pharisee, a Pharisee. I am a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, which is in Torah. Blameless. Concerning righteousness, based on Torah. Blameless. He calls all of that the confidence that comes from being in the flesh, including the righteousness which is in the law. He categorizes all that as confidence in the flesh. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ, for Messiah. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I suffered the loss of all things. I count them, everything I've just read to you, including the righteousness which is in the law. Apparently, I count all of these things as rubbish, can be translated done. That I may gain Christ, I know I'm offending a few people, but bear with me, because I think you're going to be liberated a lot today as well. He says, I, I, I count that all as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Now, Philippians 3, 9, becoming and has been one of my favorite verses in the last few years. That I may be found in him. Not, not, I want you to hear that. Not having my own righteousness from the law. I don't want the righteousness you have when you keep the law. I don't want that. It's not good enough. But I want the righteousness, I want that which is through faith in Messiah, in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. I want the righteousness which is from God, God's righteousness by faith. I want to know that I know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings and being conformed to His death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Let's read verse 9 again, Philippians 3 verse 9. I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, the kind that's from the law, which is from the law. I don't want that. But that which is through faith. I want to be found in him by having the righteousness which is from God by faith, he says, and by faith in Christ. He does go on, by the way, to continue saying the next few verses, after having first accepted the righteousness which is by faith, that he still continues making a strong effort to press on, to lay hold of that which is being offered to him. He says he's not giving much time regretting or thinking about his past failures. I have to listen to that too. He forgets those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which lie ahead, which are ahead in verse 13. So don't accuse me of saying or thinking I'm saying that we don't have to obey going forward or strive diligently to stay close to Abba and our Savior. But just realize whose righteousness counts. 
It's not mine. It's not yours. It's not the righteousness from the law. It's the perfect righteousness of God's righteousness himself, his righteousness by faith, that we can have it by faith. I know you've accepted the fact that you've been a sinner and you needed a Savior, and you've accepted Yahweh's forgiveness by grace. I get that. My question today is this. Have you accepted not just his grace, but a a big part of that grace, which is his righteousness? Have you even thought of it that way? I don't recall hearing a lot of sermons on this, at least not in the circles that I'm in. I'll show today that part of his grace includes giving you his righteousness. If you'll see it, accept it, want it, and use it. It's a part of his grace that we, are, that, that we often don't think about, but I think we need to understand, or we won't have the joy of this incredible gift. Now, there's a contrast between false religions and the one true religion. False religions all around the world including some some branches of Christianity and Messianic movements. False religions focus on how man, kind, can attain righteousness by things we do, or how we can attain their version of heaven or reincarnation or nirvana or bliss. And it's all focused on things we have to do. They teach you ways. They teach you how to make yourself right with their version of God. Too often that same approach enters into the group of believers in the one true church and in the sacrifice of his son. It is a false religion that focuses on what we must do to be righteous before Yahweh. I want you to really get that. It is a false religion that focuses on what we must do before Yahweh. The true teaching, the true religion of Christianity, of the true Messiah, focuses on what Yahweh did, what God did and continues to do to bring his children up to him and to his level and to his kingdom. Righteousness is, in its simplest terms, being right with our Maker, having a good foundation, having a good standing before him according to his standards and his requirements. Now listen carefully. You might not agree with some of the things I'm about to say, but listen carefully. Prove me wrong. But don't just throw it away if you don't agree with it. Listen carefully. The only way to be perfectly righteous enough to be in the kingdom of God is to be exactly like the sinless Son of God, exactly like Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, who committed no sins and was perfectly righteous. The only way to be perfectly righteous enough to be in the kingdom of God is to be exactly like the sinless son. Otherwise, I have to ask you, what level of unrighteousness would be allowed? How much unrighteousness? He was perfect righteousness, so how much imperfection would be allowed? i got to tell you from reading Scripture, as you read descriptions of heavenly Jerusalem, in the kingdom of God. It's the unrighteous that are described at the end of Revelation who are outside the kingdom. There is no unrighteousness. There will be no unrighteousness in the kingdom of heaven. The unrighteous won't be there, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. There's zero tolerance for sin and unrighteousness in the kingdom. Zero. So where does that leave you and me? Do we have to be perfectly obedient ourselves all the time or we simply won't be there? Sounds like that's what I'm saying, but listen carefully, that's not what I'm saying. Because none of us would be there if that's the case, for there is none righteous, no, not one, Scripture says. That's in Romans 3, around verse 10, 11, 12, somewhere in there. I'm saying today that perfect righteousness is being offered to you as a gift. A gift is not something you can earn. Turn to Romans 5, please. Romans 5, verses 17 to 19. A gift is not something you can earn, or it's no longer a gift. We read and we heard Paul's, you know, when you go to work and you work hard and they give you a salary, the salary is what you earned. We read and we heard Paul's words, I don't want my righteousness from the law, but the righteousness of God by faith in Christ. We heard that, and we know that. Now let's read Philippians, uh, Romans 5, verses 17 to 19. 
For if by one man's offense, that's Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. The gift of righteousness. How many times have you heard that discussed? How many sermons have you heard on that? How often do you talk about it? When we talk about God's gifts, how many times have we ever said the gift of righteousness? Ever. Therefore, as through one man's offense, verse 18, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, that's Adam. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men. That's the second Adam, Jesus Christ. By his righteous acts, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Verse 19, Romans 5:19. For as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. The whole family of mankind, remember, was kicked out of the Garden of Eden, including you and me in the, in the loins of Adam and Eve, if you will. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Many will be made righteous. By what? By his obedience. It's a gift. It's not enough to just have past sins forgiven, as Romans 3.25 says. Going forward, we need to know we can get it done, but we can't. For we all have sinned and, frankly, continue to sin from time to time. So we need a gift, the gift of God's own righteousness. You can't get more righteous than that. And yes, that is righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees by a galaxy mile, by a galaxy breadth. Accept this gift. Don't keep trying to do it yourself. You won't be able to, and if you could, it's no longer a gift, but something you did, and you earned it, and you can boast. But you won't be able to do it perfectly, and if it's done by our hard work, it's trying to be perfectly obedient, then we earned it. It's no longer grace. It's no longer a gift. That's what Romans 4, verses 2 to 4 says. Now beware of something. Some of you will not let anybody do anything for you without paying for it somehow, giving them a gift back or giving them a check or something. Some of you don't like to freely accept things from others, and this might spill over into the way you see this gift from Almighty God. You'd rather do something yourself, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, pay for it somehow. Beware of that, because then it's your money, your effort, you bought it, it's no longer a gift. Are we getting it? One more thing, we've been afraid to talk about this because it sounds so much like it can lead to a belief in license to sin or that we don't have to be afraid to sin. But no, 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 Romans 6 and Romans 8 are so clear that because of this great gift, we treasure and value so much. We have become debtors to show our gratitude and to have a changed life. In fact, the proof of our very salvation, that our, it, 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 the proof of our salvation is our changed, obedient life. Peter, Paul, Jude, John all speak of this in their different ways, in their books. Much more on that in the next sermon. So don't think I'm saying that you have nothing to do, you, you know, that you... But I, I, I am saying, accept the gift. We don't earn the gift. It's given to us freely. However, if we spit in Yahweh's face with an in-your-face defiant, sinful attitude once we've received this precious gift... He can revoke it, apparently. Hebrews 10, verses 26 to 31 is so clear about that. We in the West might be tempted to say, well, then it's not a gift. We can't go, go back to a life of sin like dog to a vomit. But this is not earning the gift. You've been given the gift, but it's such a great gift. The one giving you the gift wants you to appreciate it. And the life evidencing our appreciation is not our righteousness. It's still His. It's a result of being so filled with Him and by Him and His righteousness that we are being saved and being changed and being made new, and we appreciate it so much that, that the change in our life is evidence we've received the gift. If we turn around and spit in his face and reject this gift after we've tasted the heavenly gift, there is no more sacrifice available for us. Hebrews 10, verses 26 to 31 is so clear about this. Hebrews 10, verses 26. But that's an in-your-face defiant rejection of God when you clearly know what you're doing and understand it. I don't think any of you hearing this sermon are in that category. You wouldn't be hearing the sermon. Let me give you an example, if I can use an analogy, 
of how this is not earning it, but it is a, such a tremendous gift and we are to value it. Most of you hearing this are born citizens in America, and some of you are natural citizens, some of you are naturalized citizens who were given the gift of a U.S. citizenship after a legal application process, and you were accepted into the country legally, and you became a U.S. citizen. That citizenship is a great gift. It is not easy to lose the gift of citizenship. It's not easy to lose it, but it is possible to have your citizenship taken away. I researched this a little bit. In like manner, we were originally of this world, of this age, of this society. We've been transferred to the kingdom of his son and given the gift of heavenly citizenship, Philippians 3.20 says, as naturalized citizens of heaven, Philippians 3.20. We've been adopted into the family of God. The, the son of God is born into it. We are adopted into it. Says, it says that over and over again. It's a free gift. It's a great gift. We are of the earth, earthly, but have been transferred in spirit to the heavenly kingdom. Now, that's maybe a whole separate topic, but I'm just saying what Scripture says, Colossians 1. You can write this down and look it up later. Colossians 1, verses 13 to 14. Colossians 1, 13 to 14, and Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7 talk about that now. And so now we're of that realm, okay? We're now citizens of heaven. Now, even though we live here on earth, can you lose citizenship. Yes, it's not easy to, but yes, you can. You don't have to be perfect to keep it, but you can have the gift of citizenship taken away. If, for example, if you uh, publicly renounce it from abroad and defiantly give it up, yes, you can have it taken away. If you join the armed forces of another country and fight against the USA, yes, it can be taken away. If you're convicted of high treason against the USA, yes, it can be taken away. But aside from those uh, points, and maybe one or two more, uh, these are all in-your-face kind of actions, bold, defiant, aggressively uh, fighting against your citizenship in your country in some way, uh, showing you're your, your spitting at it. And we don't earn our heavenly citizenship, but once we are given that, we have to show appreciation for the kingdom, its ways, its laws, its royalty. We don't earn the righteousness. It's gifted to us, but once we've been given it, we appreciate it by going forward with a life that's changing, as led by His Spirit. Now let's go to Romans 1. Paul begins in Romans. Let's, let's explain this, how it works. I think it's such an important topic. I think you really, really want to, want to get this. It's, Paul says in Romans 1 uh, th that he was called to the gospel of God, Romans 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. He was called to the gospel of God concerning his son Jesus. Notice he calls the gospel concerning his son Jesus, verse 3, who was a descendant of David through Mary and a son of God through the Spirit. That's verses 3 and 4. So he's saying that Jesus, or Yeshua, was both man in the flesh and son of God in the Spirit. He talks about that. Then he comes to Romans 1.16, saying the gospel is about the power of God to all who believe. And he's bringing in this concept of belief right away. And understand that those who are uh, in the citizenship of heaven are all called believers. Again, in your circles, let's call one another believers and brothers and members of one another. We're never called members of the church. Never. We're members of one another. We're members of his body. And we're believers. Romans 1.17 For in it, the gospel... God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. As it's written, the righteous, as quoted from Habakkuk 2.4, will live by faith. Our righteousness is by faith now, not by ourselves or, or, or faith in our own efforts. Young's literal translation and others say this, and the righteous one by faith shall live. The righteous one by faith shall live. Or you can say the righteous will live by faith. Romans 1, verse 17 in the CJB says, For in it the gospel is revealed how God makes people righteous in his sight. God's righteousness, how God makes people righteous in his sight, and from beginning to end it is through trust, faith. Or as the Tanakh, the Old Testament puts it, but the person who is righteous will live his life by trust. That's how that version puts it. It's through faith, trust, belief that we get into this righteousness. No wonder followers of Yeshua 
are called believers. Then he comes to Romans 2, and Paul shows that if anyone could perfectly keep Torah, the law, he would be considered righteous. He would be. Deuteronomy 6.25 says that. Someone who perfectly does the law would be justified. Romans 2.13. Therefore, the, those who are those who do the law perfectly are justified in, the, in his eyes. But there was a problem. No one could. And so Romans 3 is all about how no one was perfectly righteous. No, not one. No one person, in fact, could end up being justified. No one, in fact, could end up being justified by deeds of the law because no one could do it. You have to do it perfectly or you're guilty of all. What I just said is Romans 3.20. We can't rely on our own obedience to be deemed righteous or even justified in his eyes. Now, many of you give lip service to understanding that we have to have justification by faith, but then you go on and try to be justified by your works, even or righteous by your works. Even Peter said in Acts 15, I want you to turn to this and read this. We think of Acts 15 as being about circumcision, but it was actually about a much bigger topic than just circumcision. Peter gets up in Acts 15. The question is, are we going to require Gentiles to be circumcised? But if you read verse 5, the, the sect of the Pharisees who had become converted and part of the church said that they had to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. Acts 15, verse 5. That's what they came to talk about. This is the context. It wasn't just traditions. It was not about the oral added traditions of the Pharisees, which Yeshua condemned, but it was about the law of Moses and its 613 statutes and laws. Peter gets up. Peter gets up and says this. Now remember, Peter and all the Jews there had been circumcised, as he, was, as he says the following. So he's not just talking about circumcision, because they had done that part of the law themselves perfectly already. They had been circumcised. Now, in Acts 15, verses 7 to 9, he recounts the calling and the baptism of the Gentile Cornelius, which you can read about, I think, in Acts 10, and how God gave them the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, before baptism. And then he continues in Acts 15, verses 9 to 11. Remember, the context is the law of Moses in verse 5. And Peter speaking says, And God made no distinction between us and them, between us Jews and those Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? Why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither we nor our fathers were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Master Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. What's the same manner? It was by faith. That's what he said in the beginning in verse 9. Now let's go to Romans 3.20 and read all the way to the end of the chapter. Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law, of Torah. No flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. You can't be made just and justified and made right by doing the law. If you could do it perfectly, you would be. He said that in Romans 2. I read that earlier. I think verse 13, didn't I say? But then in Romans 3.20, but no one, in Romans 3, around verse 10, 11, 12, in there he talks about how no one's done it, though. And therefore, verse 20, it's not working because no one's been able to keep the law perfectly, so therefore you can't be justified by keeping the law because we can't do it perfectly. That's what he's saying. Now in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, said it twice on two verses, through faith in Jesus Christ, 
to all and on all, on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and Yeshua HaMashiach, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. I'm in verse 25. To demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness. Okay, your, your sins are forgiven. Bang, that's gone. Going forward, what do we do? Do we go back to trying to be righteous by the deeds of the law? He says, no, the way you're going to do it going forward is to demonstrate his righteousness, that he might be the just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus, who has faith in Yeshua. What, where's boasting then? You can't have it. By what law of works? No. Verse 27, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from deeds of the law. You're made right by faith apart from deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not God also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith. Do we then make void the law? Look, don't, don't say that I'm getting rid of the law. I'm not. We're establishing the law. The law that Jesus, that Yeshua kept, and he's going to keep for us and in us and fulfill in us and for us and walk again in us, as I'll say more as we go along here. But it's going to be him and not, not us that God's looking at. It's going to be his perfect righteousness, that we accept that gift as faith. Remember, this righteousness is considered a part of grace and is a gift of Yahweh. It's a Romans 5, 17, 18, 19 say. It's part of grace. It's a gift of Yahweh to all who believe it. And we'll accept it by faith. There's, there, there's more. There's so much more. We're just getting started. Now, how do you remain righteous? By your works or by God's works? Once, once you've been forgiven, once you stand before God, what do you do now? Now let's go to Romans 5, a little earlier in the chapter. Read verses 8 to 10. Let me hasten to add, the risen Christ now lives in us and is changing us, saving us day by day. Yes, he saved us from our sins. Yes, he did. He forgave us by his blood and, and justified us and all of that. But the actual saving is something else. Romans 5, verses 8 to 10. God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, uh, Messiah, the Messiah died for us. Christ died for us. means the Messiah, the anointed. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, by his death, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For we were enemies, we were reconciled to God from through the death of his son, reconciled by his death, justified by his death. Yes, all that's by his death. But now what? The past is forgiven. Going forward, what happens? We shall be saved. We shall be saved by his life. How are we saved by his life? This answers the question again of what we do going forward. His death saves us from past sins. Or as Romans 3.25 says, from sins previously committed. But going forward, he covers us with himself, his righteousness, while our old carnal selves are considered dead. In the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die, Yahweh, Elohim, said to Adam and Eve. In the day you eat thereof, he said to Adam, and Adam told Eve about it, you shall surely die. They died 900 some years later. You can say in the days as a, as a thousand years. God was speaking spiritually. They died spiritually at that point. We have all died spiritually. We were dead. Our, our, in the flesh, we're dead. We, so we were crucified with him. We no longer live. But turn to Galatians 2.20, the life we now live and all that. Turn to Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I live in the flesh. Now, why did Paul say in the flesh he had to live by faith? Because he makes it real clear in Romans 7 that 
in the flesh, Romans 7, 18, no good thing dwells in the flesh. And that he kept doing what he really didn't want to do in the flesh. Even though he had God's Holy Spirit, his carnal nature kept failing. But Paul also teaches that God sees our fleshly side as dead. He sees us as in the spirit now, in the spirit. God no longer sees you and me if we have a spirit. God no longer sees you and me in the flesh. Though you and I are still made up of flesh, God says in Romans 8, 9, read it with your own eyes. Romans 8, 9, but you are not in the flesh. But in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But we still have a fleshly side. We still have the carnal nature that we should be crucifying and nailing down. That's why we have to live by faith in the Son of God who did it perfectly and gifts us His perfect righteousness. I'll speak much, much more about why we sin still, even the Holy Spirit, in the next sermon. Even with the Holy Spirit. Colossians 3.3 3 says something similar to Galatians 2.20. For you died. You died. And your li- the, when you sinned, you died. And your life is hidden with Christ, but then you were raised up in baptism. Romans 6 says that. And the resurrected Jesus comes into your life. And that new life, that new you, is hidden with Christ in God. And then Ephesians 2 and and Colossians 3, 10, 11 says that we are transported up to heavenly thrones, sitting right there beside God the Father in the person of Christ as part of His body. Yes, you and I are in the Holy of Holies with our Father in the person of Christ, as part of Him, as being in Him. That's a deeper concept than you might think at first. It's got to be absorbed to understand the sermon. Let's go back to Galatians 2.20 and being crucified with Christ. Do you have any idea what the next verse says before you read it? Why is verse 21, Galatians 2.21, more often not read, it's not read very often in, Christ, in, in Sabbath-keeping Christian and Messianic churches. We should read it, even while we keep Sabbath, as Paul did, Peter did, and Yeshua did. Let's not be afraid of the, any scripture. Galatians 2.21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, if righteousness comes through Torah, then Christ died in vain. There are people who will say, Philip, 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 you're getting all mixed up with Galatians. When he says the law there, he's not talking about God's law. He's talking about all those added things and the oral tradition. No, no. Go back and read Galatians 3, Galatians 4. He talks about two covenants. Not a renewed covenant, but two covenants. One represented Mount Sinai and Hagar. Mount Sinai. And one represents heavenly Jerusalem. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Are we getting it? Righteousness cannot come through the law because we fail too often to keep it. Many of you aren't even aware of all of it. In the flesh, we can't. There are 613 points of Torah. I think that's the number. Is it 617? I think it's 613. In order to stand before God as perfect, complete, and without flaw... Are you going to have to keep all 613? If you mess up in one, you failed. If you mess up in one tomorrow, you failed. Nobody can keep it perfectly. Nobody ever has except Yeshua. And if we rely on that for righteousness and perfection, we're doomed. And Paul makes that very, very clear in Galatians 3 and 4 and 5. We must rely on the perfect obedience of our Master, the Messiah, gifted to us. This is so important that I want to hit it again. What is it that makes you and me righteous enough For Yahweh to say, you and I are finally righteous. Is it our obedience to him that's making God see us as righteous? Is it our obedience to him, our obedience, that is making God see you and me as being righteous enough to be in the kingdom? 
put a long pause there because I've spoken on this before, but I don't think most of us get it. I don't know if I got it fully in 2007 when I first spoke on it. We are called to obey. We must not knowingly be disobedient. I get that. I hope you get that. And when we do disobey, I hope we all deeply repent. But is our obedience what makes us be seen as righteous by God? Is, and frankly, those of you who are trying to be righteous by Torah, I hope you understand you're failing daily in some aspect of it. Daily. Is that the righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees? That Jesus says we must have or we simply won't even be in the kingdom. Turn now to Romans 9. So obviously righteousness, one that far exceeds the legendary meticulous Pharisees version of law keeping, is required to be in God's kingdom. Not that God wants us to be more meticulous than they, because they weren't getting the point at all. That it was of the Spirit. I'm going to write my laws on their hearts. On their hearts. Not on Torah scrolls and not on tzitzit tassels, on, on, no, in their hearts. Let's read a few scriptures so it's clearly the righteousness of God by faith that is the righteousness we need, and then we'll really delve into that. Romans 9, verses 30 to uh, chapter 10. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith? But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, pursuing the law of righteousness by the law, has not attained the law of righteousness. Why? Because they, Israel, did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by works, actions of the law. They sought righteousness, I'm saying now, by what they could do, rather than what God had done and was offering to give them as a free gift, that they could accept by faith. Our righteousness is our works. When we come to God, we are to cease from our works, just as he ceased from his on the Sabbath day. We are to cease from our works and let it be his works now. God's righteousness is about his works and his working in us. Okay, that's all my commentary there. Uh, continuing on in Romans 9, end of verse 32, why did they, because they didn't seek it by faith, but by works of the law, for they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Romans 10, verses 1 to 4. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for Elohim, for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant, the Jews, Israel, for they, being ignorant, I'm in Romans 10, verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. I ask you, brethren, brothers and sisters, are you seeking to establish your righteousness? Are you trying to be good enough? Or are you going to Yeshua, to Jesus Christ and to God our Father, to dear Abba, and just saying, Father in heaven, cleanse me, clean me up, come and live in me. And yes, I accept, dear Abba, your righteousness by faith. Help me understand it, help me to accept it, and help me value it so much. And let your righteousness come into me and transform me, clean me up, and make me a new being. This righteousness by faith... Some are teaching that this righteousness of God by faith is mentioned only after the Gospels, never in the Old Testament. That, that's simply not true. Abraham is credited with the righteousness of God by faith, and Paul and, and James and others all speak of it. Uh, certainly in Genesis 15, verse 6, talks of it, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. In Hebrews 11, 7, Noah is described as being an heir of the righteousness of Heir of the righteousness that is by faith. Noah was righteous by faith. It says Abel was righteous by faith. Abraham, all of them. David often spoke of the righteousness of God as the righteousness he wanted. More on that in the next sermon. Oh, many, many psalms about 
Your righteousness is what I'm seeking. Jesus himself taught, Yeshua taught, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I want to hasten to add right now that you will not hear me talking about license to sin or throwing out the Ten Commandments or not having to obey God now since we have this gift of his righteousness. You will hear me explain that our righteousness is not what will earn us the, uh, earn us the kingdom of God. But when we receive this righteousness of God, it is active. It's not a passive thing. It's active in us. And Yeshua will live his life more and more perfectly in us until Christ is formed in you. Galatians 4.19 says, Until the Messiah is formed in you. I just want to be sure. He, he said, I'm, I'm like a mother going through birth pangs and whatever, uh, trying to take care of I forget how he puts it there. But anyway, it says, Until Christ is formed in you. I just want to be sure you realize that this is such a great gift. We just don't nearly hear about it nearly enough. I'm going to transition a bit for a few minutes to how we have this righteousness going forward. A little bit more on that. We've been called to be witnesses of his resurrection. How on earth can you and I be a witness of the resurrection that happened almost 2,000 years ago? Well, brethren, listen carefully, because you must be. Yes, Master is walking the earth again. You can witness to that, but this time not in one human body, but in thousands of believing members of his body. I think we're not witnessing the transformations we should be witnessing because we don't quite believe he lives in us this time in his way. If we really believed it, the evidence would soon be there. Since we don't believe it, we don't see the evidence. Belief has to come before evidence. Since we don't talk enough about the gift of his righteousness and haven't understood it or seen it, we don't see it. And we aren't being great witnesses of him walking and living in our lives. Believe first, then we'll see what we believe. Believe you are righteous with the same righteousness that Yeshua had. The very same. And it will start to transform us. And it will start to change our lives. Yeshua said to Thomas, Blessed are they, Thomas, who believe without having first seen. Because Thomas says, I'll see it when I believe it. And then Yeshua appears before him and says, the king says, Look, Thomas, here are my hands. Here's the nail prints in my hands. Do you realize that the very name Yahweh, yod Hey vod Hey, in its pictorial form, says, See the nail. See the hand. That's what it says pictorially, the, the very name Yahweh. I know it means the eternal, the I am who I am, the ever, ever living one. That's what it means. But the drawings, the pictures that went into it is see the hand, see the nail. yod Hey vod Hey. If you study Hebrew, you'll see that. Believe perfection resides in you via the perfect life of Messiah who resides in you and it's being formed in you over time and in time I'm convinced our lives will evidence and witness to that more and more. We see things in our hearts first before they become literal realities. But we do have to see it in our minds and hearts first. Believe in our hearts first. And that becomes, as, as He shines brighter and brighter in us and transforms us, changes us, converts us, that's a powerful testimony to His resurrection, besides openly confessing Him with our mouth, that it says in Romans 10. We're to be witnesses of His resurrections, and we do that by having a transformed life. And don't forget, though it's a really a different topic, we are saved by grace, but we still will be rewarded by our good works, by the good things we do. I don't think that just means keeping Torah. I think that literally means by the good deeds we do, around uh, the love that we show to everybody. Never mix up the two. Salvation's a free gift by grace. Rewards are based on what we do with that grace and the power offered us. You're rewarded according to works, it says in Revelation 20, and verse 13, and Matthew 16, verse 27. Matthew, that's a different topic, though. Let's move on. We are being spiritually created to be just like Him. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Do you remember what God did when He created, just before He created Adam and, 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 and Ava and Eve? Uh, that's their Hebrew name, Adam and Ava. Uh, he says, uh, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And, and we shall be like Christ to the, the, to the degree we're going to be like him. 
uh, to the very same degree that the Messiah was just like his father. We're told in Romans 8.29 that we're being conformed to the image of his son. We're being conformed. It's not happened all at once yet. But at the resurrection, it says in 1 Corinthians 15.49, it says, as we have borne the image of the man of dust, just like we look like Adam, not just look like him, but have that character and have those weakness and have human nature and all of that, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. 1 Corinthians 15.49. That's when this corruption shall put on incorruption, as it says in verse 53. What's all this got to do with God's righteousness? Well, it's His righteousness, and we're supposed to look more and more and more like Him, and as He is formed in us, that will happen. The Savior lives in us and is forming Himself in us. If we believe, submit to it, accept it, until finally, at the resurrection, 1 John 3, 2 and 3 says, Beloved, now are we children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. But we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We shall be, let me say, just like Him. Okay, when Yeshua said, Philip, have I been with you so long that you don't know that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why do you ask to see the Father? Take a look at me. You want to know what Father's like? He's like I am. If we're letting the risen Christ rise and shine in my life and your life, and I've got to open the door much wider to this than I've ever done before, I should be able to say if someone asks me, what is Jesus Christ like? What is Yeshua like? I should be able to say and point to a believer and say, you want to know what Yeshua is like? Get to know Michael over there. Get to know Nathan. Get to know James. Get to know John over there. Or Mary and Harriet over there. As you get to know them, you'll find out what Yeshua was like, because they are just like him, or becoming more and more like him. I just can't have the temerity to say, <laughs> I suppose we should be able to, as we're getting more and more like him, to be able to say, well, you want to know what he's like? Take a look at me. But that would sound so vain, and I certainly am nowhere, anywhere, not one zillionth of a way there yet. That's why I said earlier, you've got to open that door wide open to it. But when we're resurrected, the final step is taken and the corruption finally puts on incorruption. At the, final, at the resurrection, we finally bear the image of the heavenly. In the resurrection, we shall be like him. For we shall at that time see him as he is. And everyone, I'm reading the end of First John 3, verses 2 and 3. And everyone who has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. You hearing it? We're being offered Yahweh's own perfect righteousness as a gift. As we accept it, we're proving and demonstrating his son has risen from the dead, as it should be more and more obvious in our lives, being radically transformed, that he lives. The tomb is empty. He's in here now. That change, that transformation is also proof of our salvation going on. Let's read a familiar passage, Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. The Protestant side and the Catholic, well, Protestants especially, love verses 8 and 9. They don't often read verse 10. Some do. Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. You've been saved by a gift, not, not, not of works, lest anyone should boast. However, he goes on in verse 10 to say, for we are his workmanship. He's working something in us. He's creating something in us, created in Christ Jesus for good works. <coughs> We're being created in him for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So are we not to do good things, good works? Yeah, we are, but that's not what saves us. We can't go on living a life of sin, claiming to be children of God, 
we all still stumble once in a while. We all know that, okay? So, um, Yahweh alone is holy, and as we as He comes into our lives, that makes us holy as well. We can't make ourselves holy. There's nothing I can do to be holy. He has to do it. Now, I have to pursue holiness once He's in me. I have to protect and guard it once He's there. But only, it says in Revelation 15, 4, in the Song of Moses, For you alone are holy. You alone are holy. And only He can make anything holy. The angels are holy only because He has made them holy. A temple is holy only if His presence is in it. I am holy and you are holy, holy only if He comes to us. Mount Sinai was holy only when He was there. Take the sandals off your feet for the, the, the land, the ground upon which you stand is holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. We are holy dirt ourselves. And that is why even imperfect Corinthians could be called saints, which means holy ones, from the Greek word hagios. Because though, though they weren't doing so well, in, they weren't doing so well in the flesh, because their Savior is holy, they were also hagios, holy saints. We become the temple of God's Holy Spirit. We know that Yeshua comes into our bodies by His Spirit. He sees the temple of Yahweh. Our bodies need cleansing. And he goes about cleansing God's house, just like he did on earth 2,000 years ago. And he's chasing out the money changers and the cheats and everything else <clears throat> in the den of thieves in our lives. Let him, invite him to. Open the doors wide. Let him purify his house, which is your life and your body. That's now the temple of the Holy Spirit that does need cleaning up. Open wide the doors. Let Him purify your life and mine with His blood, with the washing of the water by the Word, until He can present you and me without spot or wrinkle, but a perfect bride of the Lamb. Notice in Ephesians 5, it says that He sanctifies and cleanses us. He presents us to Himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. He has the spot remover. He has the iron to take out the wrinkles. He makes us perfect. Jude 24 says he is the one who will present us faultless before him. Are you faultless? Will you ever be faultless in this life? On your own efforts? Even with the Holy Spirit? Will you be faultless because of perfect obedience on your part? No. No. By our King's perfect obedience which is what Father sees over and over us and, 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 and clothing us and which we will be judged by if, great big if, if we believe in Him and accept His righteousness as a gift and value it. Now, how is this given to us? Let's go back to Romans 4. Romans 4. It states the, raises the ante quite a bit. He brings up more and more about imputed righteousness or incredited. It's like an accounting term, credited righteousness. I'd rather have the works of God working in me rather than my works. Turn now to Romans 4, verses 1 to 6. This belief and trust in his righteousness is an active belief. It's not passive. It's very active. It's working in us. He's living in us. Romans 4, verses 1 to 6. What can we say then about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? If Abraham was justified by what he did, by works, then he has something to brag about, but not before God. For what the scriptures say, Genesis 15, says Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. Now, to the one who works, pay is not considered as a gift, but it's something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes on him who declares righteous the ungodly, he declares the ungodly righteous. Are we getting it? The ungodly, if we believe in God, he will declare the ungodly righteous. Romans 4 verse 5. His faith is imputed, credited for righteousness. Likewise, David also speaks of the blessing of the man to whom God credits or imputes righteousness 
apart from works. So if we believe God's willing to impart, impute, credit his righteousness, how can it get any better than that? If you want to work out your own salvation by yourself, then you've earned it yourself, and you can brag, you can look to yourself, you can, and you're owed no grace. But I failed, and you failed, and we keep failing. And so we have to accept his, right, his righteousness as, as a gift, or we're not going to be in the kingdom at all because we failed, and we keep failing. Now, you who don't like to owe anything to anybody or be indebted to or beholden to anybody, beware of this because you may not have fully accepted this free gift of righteousness. I said it earlier. I want to say it again. If you want to try to do it by what you do and all the work you do in the church and all things like that, then you're earning it. It's no longer a free gift. Now, what about Philippians 2.12? Some of you are saying you, you said work out your own salvation. Philip, isn't that what Philippians 2.12 says? Yeah, let's go back and read that. Philippians 2.12 does it say we're to work out? Yeah, it does say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How many of you know, without looking, what the very next verse says? And why is Philippians 2.13 never read? As far as I've heard recently anyway, in Church of God groups, the Sabbath-keeping Church of God groups and Messianic groups. Because it's never read because I don't think people understand it, want to understand it. I never hear the next verse read in church groups that have uh, that like to have something to do in terms of their righteousness. Okay, Philippians 2.12 says, it, is, it says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it is God, it is Yahweh, it is Elohim who works in you, both to will, both to want to do, and to do according to his good pleasure. Work out your salvation, because God is the one working in you, doing it, making you want to do it. So listen to him, cooperate with that, and let him work in you is what he's saying. There's no contradiction, but the way Philippians 2.12 is often read is not correct, that somehow we have to work out our own salvation. We're our own saviors? Are you kidding me? We're our own saviors? Is that what Philippians 2.12 means to you? God is the one who works out the salvation in us. And we work with Him. We stay abiding in Him. Now, was, God own, was God's own imputed righteousness good only for Abraham? Imagine being credited with God's righteousness every time Yahweh looks at you. Romans 4, verses 23 to 25 now. Let's go there. Romans 4, 23 to 25. Now, it was not written for Abraham's sake alone that it was imputed to him, righteousness, but also for us. Righteousness, or it, shall be imputed or credited to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up, so on. It shall be imputed to us. Now we come to Romans 5. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, we can now have peace and rejoice, get rid of guilt and condemnation. Romans 5, 12. For by one man Adam and sin entered the world, and then we come to verse 17, the overflow of grace and the gift, so on. And we come to Romans 5:17, that we come to this gift of righteousness. Since by and I'm reading out of another translation here, since by one man Adam's trespass, death reigned through that one man. How much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness? through this one man, Jesus Christ, and so on. So it's a gift, okay? And it's something that God imputes to us once we accept it. In other words, keep in mind that, be turning now to 2 Corinthians 5.20, keep in mind that when we repented of our sins, we owed a tremendous, we owed a tremendous uh, debt. And he forgave us that debt. But now we're bankrupt. And so God is saying, look, what you owed me is gone. I will now give you my trillions and zillions of dollars, so to speak, if we're talking finances. And I'll impute what's in my bank account to you. And you become a co-heir with Jesus Christ of everything I have. 
I impute everything to you. So you are now no longer bankrupt, but are full of the righteousness of God. Love it, brethren. Accept it. Cherish it. It's better than any lottery. Turn now to 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 and 21, what I call uh, the swap. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we hear and we talk about the new creation. For you are a new creation in Christ, something that's never been before. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You've now been begotten into the family of God. You can't beget yourself. Those who want to work out your own salvation, you can't beget yourself. You can't create the new you any more than you can have anything to do with your earthly begettal. You're not the creator of the new you. I don't want to be the creator of the new me. I can't create a new me. Only he can do it. Only he is creator. Abba is the creator. Dear Yahweh is in Christ. And that's how it's happening. And now Father offers us an incredible bargain that he explains in 2 Corinthians 5 verses 20 and 21. He's willing to cancel the sin debts we have. Take that upon himself. I call it the big swap. Give me your sins and I'll give you my righteousness if you believe. Whoa. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, 20 and 21. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He took our sins upon himself, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Give me your sins, I give you my righteousness. Take me as your Savior, and I will be your Savior. And I will impute my perfectness to you. It's also what we just read in Romans 4 and 3, 4, 5. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4 says, God says he knows that we could not fulfill the righteous requirement of the law because of the flesh, but he sent his Son that the righteous requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us. Are we hearing it? How come we don't hear it more in church? We do have to follow his lead. We do have to seek him with all our heart. I'll talk more about the being a, uh, like a, a branch on a vine and all that in the next sermon and how we grow and how, why we keep sinning and how we can, how we can uh, overcome sin more. And preaching to myself, I've got a lot of sin to overcome in my life. But he's forgiven that, and he lives in me, and he will live and be formed in me. So here's what our Savior in heaven is saying. Philip, give me your sins, and I will give you my perfect righteousness. Put your name in there. But you do have to believe in me and have faith in me. Impute your sins to me, and I will impute my righteousness to you. Give me your sins, and I'll pay the penalty for you at Golgotha. My son will. Our Savior is saying this, I mean, and I'll I'll, I'll pay it at Golgotha, and I'll impute and credit my righteousness to you. Then I want to come alongside you, inside you with my spirit, live on the earth once more inside of you, cleanse the temple of God that you are, and and, and make you a house of God worthy for, for as a house of prayer. My righteousness covers you. You can't get any better than that. That's what Yeshua is saying to us. Then Yahweh our Abba, our dear Father, our very own Father in the highest, Continues by adding, he says, you become mine and I become yours. What a swap, brethren. You become my people and I become your God. Yahweh's always wanted children, a family, his own people. That's what it's all about. And we need the righteousness of Jesus Christ covering us to get there. His law is written in our hearts now and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Father continues, though you died due to your sins when you accepted my son and his righteousness, I gave you life. I give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit dwelling in you. Father says you will no longer be the life. Your life will no longer be the life that I see. No, no. But the life I see will be Christ, my Son. Perfect Son. Living in you and you in Him. And He's made one body, all of you, into one body. And the life you now live will be by His faith and faith in Him. Father continues, over time you'll look more and more like my son in his image until you're exactly just like him in every way at the resurrection. My son is being formed in you. Galatians 4.19 And if you let him, if you believe, if you will accept it, you'll see this happen. This transformation will be real. And dear Abba concludes, 
and you will be my witnesses on the earth. And your king will witness about you before heaven. How about that for a swap? You witness about me on earth, and I will, and, and, and your king, Yeshua, will witness about you before me in heaven, Abba says, defending you against the adversary Satan, who accuses you night and day. But be of good cheer, because you're in me now, because you're in my son who is in me. You're part of his body. And I have your back. If you'll be silent and listen once in a while, you'll hear me speak to you in thoughts and strong feelings as you study my word, as you come and commute to me, commune with me, as you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. And I will guide you and lead you by the spirit which I'm giving you. And if you hang with my son, stay attached to him, seek him and me, your dear Abba, with all your heart, with all your being, with all your heart, you will bear much fruit. You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, which bears fruit in its season. Go, spread the word, for I'm with you always. I will never, child, he says to us, I will never, ever, ever, absolutely never, ever leave you or forsake you. But don't forsake me either. Seek me and you will find me. I want to be found of you. I'm out of time. We need to be claiming more of the victory, folks. We need to be experiencing the joy of his peace. If we really understand this now, there's so much more to say, but we're out of time. Next time, I want to talk about why do we still sin if Christ is in us. We'll carefully study Romans 7 and 8 and other passages. Is all sin forgiven or just past sins? We'll talk about that. How do we make sure we're bearing fruit, becoming more and more like our Savior? Is there hard work we are to do? Yes, there is. But what is it? Is it our own righteousness? No, no, it isn't. If righteousness is gifted to us, where do we have to strive and be diligent? Scripture's clear on that. I'll talk about that next time. Brethren, I hope you'll accept your Lord and Master, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as your King and your, your righteousness by faith. I hope you'll accept this gift. Open wide your doors let it pour in. Let God's gift rain down from you like heaven, from you, like the righteousness from heaven. Again, I asked you earlier, if you could, would you want your righteousness or do you want God's righteousness? Do you want your works or do you want his gift? I know what I want. I hope that's liberating to you. Next time we'll continue the, the, the thoughts. And I hope that this will bring you great joy and time as you absorb it. Until next time, this is Philip Shields, your brother in the Messiah. Be sure to tune in for the next couple of messages as we wrap up this exciting topic. Praise Yahweh. Praise Yeshua, our mighty King. Amen.